Good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending the Innovation in Payments and Remittances MEI event. I uh, hope everyone's well. In this session, we'll be discussing the international money transfer market, including the challenges, trends, and opportunities seen across the industry. I'm Amir Abedi, the CMO at Remit One, and I will be hosting today's event. We have an hour and 15 minutes for today's webinar. For the first 50 minutes, uh, I'll be moderating a discussion with our expert panelists. Uh, then there will be 20 minutes at the end of the session for questions from the audience. So please submit your questions via the Q&A button on the right-hand side of your screen at any point during the webinar, and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the session. Again, the, end, the session is for 50 minutes, and then we have a Q&A for 20 minutes. Um, we'd also like to send, send a special thanks to our event sponsors. That's Vine, Nyragram, Trust Payments, as a finance, world pay, GBG, and currency cloud. Please make sure that you visit their virtual booths uh, between the panel sessions. Uh, this is, of course, a two-day event. Uh, this is the very first session. Um, so please make sure that you visit uh, their virtual booths, um, which you can navigate to via the menu at the top of your screen. They'd love to hear from you, speak to you about the business challenges you're, fa you're currently facing, and see how they can support you. Before we dive into the discussion, just a few words about Remit One, the organizers behind today's event. As a company, our mission at Remit One is to empower the global money transfer industry with technology and business solutions to provide secure and fair transfers for those who need it most. That's why in 2018, Remit One launched Innovation in Payments and Remittances, also known as IPR, to bring together various industry supply chain members to help drive positive change in the industry. We are grateful that so many of you have joined the session today to continue this mission with us. I would like to now introduce my fellow panelists. Just give me one second. I just want to make sure you can hear me. Uh, Leon, can you just checking? Alex? Can you hear me? Uh, you're in mute. Okay. Sorry about that. Other. Yeah. It went really quiet there. Uh, okay, so um, introducing my esteemed panelists. I'm very, very pleased um, to introduce our expert panelists today. Firstly, joining us, we have Mr. Hassan Al Fardan, the CEO of Al Fardan Exchange. Uh, Hassan holds a bachelor's degree with specialization in finance and also holds a master's degree in real estate, finance, and investment. This led him to work as a real estate analyst at the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority. His stint with ADIA provided him with exposure to complex global deals involving multiple geographies. Next up is Elizabeth Rosiello, the CEO of Aza Finance. Elizabeth founded the company in Nairobi, Kenya, to bring digital currencies to the African market. She's committed to expanding access to financial technologies, co-chairing the World Economic Forum's Council on Blockchain, in addition to sitting on the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution's Global Advisory Board, she was also recently named as a 2021 Bloomberg New Economy Catalyst. Also joining us is Alex Orshoff, Director of Financial Services, Vertical Growth at WorldPay from FIS. Alex has had 10 plus, 10 plus years of experience in driving strategic growth and accelerating innovation in the financial services industry in North America, Europe, and the Middle East. Um, at WorldPay, Alex continues to have his ears to the ground on emerging trends in financial services and healthcare, and translates those insights to evolve payment solutions to best serve WorldPay and FIS's financial services merchants and their customers' payment journeys. And finally, we have uh, Leon Isaacs, the CEO of DMA Global. Leon is the founder and chief executive officer of DMA Global, the specialist international development company that he founded in 2007. He is a seasoned expert and business leader in the payments and international development fields with a particular expertise in uh, migrant remittances. He has over 30 years hands-on experience in this space. So without further ado, uh, further ado, let's get into today's panel discussion. Uh, the first question is for Leon. And this, you know, uh, this will set the, the tone uh, for the discussion. The World Bank reported remittance flows grew by 7% in 2021 and declined by only 1.7% in 2020. 
This is despite a severe global recession caused by COVID-19, and it proved the resilience of our industry. What factors do you think have contributed to this growth? Leon? Hi, um, thanks, Amir, and um, good morning to everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you here this morning. Um, I won't take too long on this answer. I think it's been reasonably well documented in terms of people's uh, understanding of what's happened. I think it will take a lot longer for us to be able to get any sort of real evidence of all the reasons. But I think um, the first point actually in the question is about the resilience of remittances. Uh, and I think the point is that the people who are sending remittances, they need to send money. They've moved to another country specifically to earn money to send back to their families and to support them both with uh, consumption and investment needs. And that need doesn't just disappear. In fact, it probably increased during COVID times as families back home found it even harder. So it really meant that people who were sending money were even more committed to find ways to do it. And I think the numbers back that up. But I think there are a number of other contributing factors, um, which um, I'm not going to go estimate in order of importance. But I think one was actually government actions in many countries, particularly the um, social support network or, or funding that they provided to many um, people um, really helped. I think obviously a lot of migrants also worked in or work in some of the essential industries, particularly health and so on. And so they were still able to earn uh, and send money home. And I think some of the actions governments took to try and make it a bit easier from a technical viewpoint to be able to move money from country A to country B also helped. Uh, perhaps some changes in some countries on the level of KYC um, identification limits and so on that had previously been there were reduced to make, to make it easier for people to access markets. But I think one of the key things, uh, which I think I know is going to feature quite heavily today, is actually the changing ways in which money was able to move. So the shift to digital, um, as it's been uh, termed, has clearly had quite an impact. And now you see every company that makes any pronouncement on remittances is always talking about their digital strategy, how that's making a change in what they're doing. And I think this, um, this focus has really helped to actually bring more, some more people to the market. Um, the other point I think we shouldn't forget is that actually it's generally assumed, and I think there's evidence to support this, that people who were using informal methods found it much harder to actually use those during the crisis because a lot of the informal operators relied on physically moving or carrying very large sums of money to different parts of the world. And with the travel uh, bans taking place, it was actually very difficult for them to maintain their supply chains. So we think that that's led to a lot of people actually moving to alternatives, many of which were formal, so then they come into the official numbers. Uh, and I think if we actually look at what's happening in places like Sri Lanka, uh, and I just saw Bangladesh announce their monthly figures just um, this morning, you can see that some of the countries that um, have, and have always had informal remittance markets, are now seeing a decrease in remittance volumes. Uh, and an amount of this is being put down to the fact that people have gone back to using informal methods. So it will be one to watch in the future whether that stays as it is or moves forward. Um, I think the other thing is, apart from the, di well, within the digitization, I think there've been different business models coming out that we've seen as well that have really helped. And for instance, we've seen the aggregation model seems to really have taken off. So now it's much easier for businesses to be able to establish themselves in one country, but actually be able to send to multiple markets. So there's a good deal of innovation, which is why, which obviously matches with the title of the conference here. Um, but I think at the end of the day, what we've really seen is there's this pent up demand from migrants and others to want to send money home and continue to want to do it. Uh, and it, the demands from their families have probably been even more pressure on them. So 
I think those are some of the reasons. I'll stop there so some of the, my fellow panelists can give uh, their point of view on this as well. Yeah, sure. A any comments from my fellow panelists, Hassan, Elizabeth, Alex, to add to what Leon said? Sure, if I may, you know, I, I very much, please, very much, yeah, very much echo and agree with with a lot of Leon's sentiments. Obviously, uh, you, UAE, you know, the market that we uh, we, we predominantly serve, you know, is, is the second largest uh, outbound market in, in the world, and uh, obviously the the organizations that uh, that had a, a higher degree of digital preparedness. I know people talk about digital transformation; it's a big buzzword, but ultimately it needs to it needs to translate to some degree of digital preparedness. Companies that were that were definitely much better uh, prepared and benefited from, uh, drastically, uh, you know, converting traditional cash business into in, in, into digital business. Now, one of the one of the challenges that we faced during that time was the need to expedite, you know, uh, the digital lombarding because you had situations where, you know, uh, the sort of um, uh, lockdowns and people could not actually come come to to, to the networks. Uh, and Leon lays, raised a very, very important point. Now, you know, uh, obviously, uh, as, as an industry, and I sit on the on the UAE uh, industry body, the Foreign Exchange Group, we played, uh, I would say, a fundamental role, uh, sort of consulting with the with the local regulators and with the government, on uh, sort of emphasizing the importance that, that remittances needs to be viewed as an essential service, in the same way that you look at hospitals, in the same way that you look at, at uh, you know at, at grocery stores and pharmacies and whatnot. So by, by recognizing that it, it is it is an essential service, and, and if, if people don't transfer the money back to their, their home ones, to, to, the, to their uh, to their loved ones at home, uh, that they will not be able to meet uh, to meet uh, you know uh, basic needs. So you know there are there are you know, I would say a select number of players that, that were digitally prepared that, that didn't have to go through very severe uh, you know uh, reductions in salaries, following people, uh, terminating and reducing the operations. Uh, and then we were fortunately one of those companies that was very prepared, and we saw a very, very significant increase, uh, you know, within our digital remittances, roughly around, uh, I think, around 9x, if I'm not mistaken. And again, uh, I associate very, very much with what Leon said about uh, uh, the channeling some of the informal, uh, the informal business, the the hawala and the, the, the you know, and whatnot, to to the formal channels. But as we started to see uh, some relaxation and and uh, you know and travel, uh, sort of travel. You know, requirements and protocols and all that we've actually seen some people divert back to that uh, to that market and uh, we are working quite closely with uh, with a number of local authorities to try to, to try to address that issue you know the biggest risk uh, you know with that sector being that there's, there's a lack of, uh, of of regulatory oversight and you don't have the benefit of, of robust uh, kyc aml and generally compliance uh, framework so something that we are uh, you know we're definitely addressing uh, at, at the industry level we're addressing it at uh, i would say uh, you know with the, with the government and we're also addressing it with our, with our correspondent uh, banking partners across the globe you know and particularly particularly within within the southeast asian market right thank you hassan elizabeth alex would you like to add anything no and echoing um what leon was mentioning as well is that a lot of what has happened thanks to COVID is that people have been introduced to new digital options and that has forced companies to really innovate quickly and offer a lot of different um, avenues that people were not necessarily curious about before or um, and it largely bootstrapped, let's say that. So it's not hasn't been the best onboarding experience for people because we, we've been just uh, trying to get everything online for our partners as quickly as possible and it's not necessarily the most efficient now to retain clients to retain people in this uh, we have to constantly iterate in the ways that they want to create the experience for sending money in the way they prefer and that that requires really looking at what like what is the target market that you're you're aiming for as a money transfer business what are the ways that they prefer to pay uh, what and how do you make that as frictionless as possible so that they choose to have that digital experience that you're offering versus what the alternative that might not be as attractive from a cost perspective to manage. So um, with that, you we my my advice in general is we we got in that digital option. A lot of times when people are leaving the digital option, it's just because it's not as easy or maintainable as the previous option that they had before. And it, it just, um, and most people will prefer the digital option going forward, including the regulators. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. So, um, and as a finance, we process 
for over 28 of the largest remittance companies into, out of, and across the African continent. And already six years ago, one of our fastest growing operators launched a corridor into Nigeria, digital only. And it was the fastest growing product they'd ever launched. And before that, they were a cash only agent collection um, remittance company, mainly out of North America. So for me, I don't know why we even use the word digital because it's what is remittance without digital at this point and what is financial services without digital. So, you know, we don't even think to work with companies that don't have a digital offering. It's like saying, what is digital banking? Everything is digital these days. I think we need to go beyond that. Um, it's not just, you know, how to get things digitized. It's how to streamline operations and optimize in a world that's so fast moving. And I think what we saw over COVID was the companies that were digitally native and had incorporated this, not only just to launch a new product, but actually completely within their operations, their ethos, the way they communicated both with the sending and the payout, the way that they operated with their stakeholders and their partners, the companies that can quickly add on new API integrations, the companies that can quickly sign commercial partnerships that are streamlined, that know how to manage their treasury. These are the companies that win going forward. And we saw a real breakdown in companies that couldn't. One of the largest cash only um, agent networks in all of West Africa collapsed mainly because of co corporate governance and operations issues. Um, they, they dominated the market, they had the brand, they had the funding. It was really just operations. How do we operate in, in a modern, fast moving time? And I think that's really the key to this. I and mean, it's obvious that we need to use mobile solutions. We need to be having customers come with cashless touch um, I think it's in the next few years we're going to see the removal of cash. I know that everybody says cash is king, um, but I really still believe we're moving rapidly towards a place that's not the case anymore. So I agree with what everybody said, but I would just say let's accelerate that a little bit more because the reality on the ground is that the fastest growing companies in the space that we see, because we see everybody's volumes, um, are those that are incorporating this from head to toe. So, no, Elizabeth, that's yeah. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was going to mention, you're you're 100% right. That's one of the things that we see in our clientele all the time, um, considering we offer real-time or real-time treasury products as well. And it, it's only getting faster to know, like, what what is your funding position on a, a daily basis? And that means that, okay, you know exactly how much you have to borrow to cover any sort of settlement challenges that you might have. And the more transparency you have into those operations, the better that you're able to manage that means that you can do your operations more cheaply, as well as prevent any of the key risks that might happen if there's a sudden shift due to geopolitical event or regulatory change. Um, so that you can essentially outpace those, those challenges and prepare for them. So there is, of course, even at Remit One, for example, what we're witnessing here, I mean, we service uh, a range of fintech companies, MTOs and banks as well, from a software perspective, of course, technology solutions perspective. And there is, you're absolutely right, there is 100%, literally 100% shift to digital. But um, is it this, I mean, is it still fair to say that the MTOs who are cash based, like I know, Elizabeth, you mentioned you, you operate in uh, uh, Africa, Latin America, other regions, for example, um, uh, Middle East, uh, the, 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 there is still a, you know, a lot of emphasis on cash, right? And as you right. mentioned earlier, there are still people have started going back to the Hawala system, which is, of course, you know, from a terminology perspective, is non-digital. I mean, how do we reconcile the two comments here? Sure. Well, first of all, you know, even cash networks use digital verification networks. I mean, nobody picks up cash with a paper slip anymore. Um, nobody goes really into the bank with a you know printed out terminal. You're getting a mobile code on your phone, and then you're going to the cash agent network. And the cash agent network is dominated by mobile treasury and float operations that are digitized. Um, and if they're not, they're not going to work. So you know even the largest cash networks and some of the most um, rural or frontier populations. Are, are getting outpaced by new entrants and startups that are coming in with mobile treasury management and cash float management that's done digitally. So if you're going to have an agent network of several hundred operators, several thousand operators, there's no way you're going to win unless you're competing with these young startups that are coming in. I mean, look at SendWave right now. Um, they've come in market after market, completely dominated um, the user experience 
their cash agent loves them. Now, of course, maybe some monopolies have pushed them out in some places, uh, but it's not because the users don't want it or because they're not better from an optimized perspective. And I think mm -hmm. that's just the future. We've seen Makuru, we've seen Mama Money, we've seen um, so many young companies, Azimos, you know, come into these markets with digital. And this is already five, seven years now. So this is nothing new. Um, this is the future. So I think um, the companies that aren't thinking about that from a user perspective, from a mobile perspective, are, are missing out. And again, it's not just the app, it's also the cash management, the operations, the treasury management. Um, we have a lot of big companies come in and you know don't pay their float bills and, um, and we mm -hmm. stop their transactions. So I, don't, so I think it's, I think at this point, you know, uh, we can't just, survive on the power of a big brand anymore um, because there's so many competitors and new entrants to the market, which is better for the users in the end. Asin, how is it um, uh, in the UAE, for example, do you have some some data to share with the, our audience here about this channel cannibalization from cash to sure. digital? Is this supporting right. what others are saying here? Sure, it, uh, you know, the UAE market perhaps is uh, slightly different, you know, when, when you look at uh, sort of the construct, the construct of our demographics, uh, you know, there is um, obviously largely dominated by the South Asian subcontinent. Now, now there is a very large uptick and, and a very large, I would say, you know, migration from, uh, from traditional cash to digital. And, and the rate of growth is, is, is quite aggressive. However, however, uh, cash is still very much, very much dominant yeah, any, uh, from, from the numbers that I've seen. Uh, still around 70 to 80 percent of the market is still operating on a cash basis and uh, and it's not it's not necessarily because of a lack of, of an availability of digital uh, digital uh, solutions or digital touch points ultimately you know I, I, speaking perhaps on, on, on my own organization you know th there's absolutely no difference in the back-end processing and the treasury you know from um, from the perspective of the customer it's just a question of that customer making a choice either to transact on our application or or, or attend uh, a branch network uh, you know, as, as as an organization, and I think as an industry as well, you know, we, we hear a lot of, uh, of emphasis on, on, on digitally driven financial inclusion. But digi digitally driven financial inclusion doesn't mean that you exclude the cash customers as well. So until uh, until so long as there is a demand uh, for, for cash based remittances, you know, we will continue to have uh, to have our network. Ours is one of the largest in, in, the, in this market. Um, so, so long as it's relevant and so long as there's a customer preference, uh, definitely, I think it's, it's relevant and important to have those, uh, you know, those uh, those optionalities now yeah. within 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 the actual uh, uh, customer customer journey uh, we're not uh, you know the the transactional use of cash is going down and uh, you know one of one of the services that we've seen uh, quite a drastic increase in is, is the use of our of our uh, of our digital uh, uh, payments methods for example like our cards and and, and our wallet based uh, remittance payment systems so uh, so the future is definitely digital uh, the, the the migration is definitely uh, much higher uh, and it will to continue to accelerate, I think, in the coming years. But I, I still see cash being relevant in the medium term. So you, you have regulatory pressures, of course. Uh, for example, in the UK and Europe, uh, uh, we have a lot of experience uh, dealing with clients, of course, uh, uh, from here, uh, especially. Um, and there is a lot of regulatory pressure to to go digital. So if you're a cash-based business, if you you know the it just, the regulator just makes the landscape really hard for you to operate. Uh, you know, the companies that collect cash from the agent shops, et cetera, um, is dominated by, uh, you know, I think pretty much by a single player, um, which doesn't make uh, uh, it conducive for other participants to participate in a fair manner. Uh, it just makes it very difficult for cash-based businesses here to operate. But this is, I think, this is down to the pressure coming from the regulator. In the case of, um, I think, um, uh, Leon, from your perspective, uh, for the benefit of our audience as well because we have you know a huge number here you know um so from from their perspective i'm sure they would like to know um companies where, where is this reluctance from the end user based on the research you know data that you have access to uh is there a market out there where the consumers are refusing to go digital and they're te you know they, they just want to carry on using cash i know there are a few regions uh that 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 showed a lot of reluctance to, ad to yeah. go digital. and this well, of course has an effect on the on the mtos 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a really interesting discussion, and I, I tend to support everything um, that Elizabeth has said, really, about where everything's going. I think it depends on which region of the world as to how fast it gets there. And I also think it depends on your time horizon. You know, some parts of the world have been going, you know, 10 years or more using various digital services. And they was really, whilst the benefits to the users are, are normally so self-evident, you do wonder why people don't change. But there are a lot of cultural um, and historical factors. And also we've got to affect, you know, remember a lot of, people in the world have come from countries where um, they haven't necessarily had significant uh, amounts of money themselves, but also they haven't trusted governments with anything that involves, that they haven't trusted local banks at all. They think governments may have influences over banks or banks have collapsed and so on. So there's still a generation out there that has a deep mistrust of anything that's not physically in their hands or in somebody else's. But I think what, um, and, and some of the research that's been done during you know, the COVID crisis is that actually there are solutions. And when a lot of the physical shops were closed, money did flow, it flowed digitally. And it was actually the younger generation, if I call it that as an old person, that was actually um, sending money on behalf of the older generations. People always find solutions. And I think when COVID, came along it acted as both a catalyst for people to start understanding some of the other alternatives and i think what we're seeing is that mo a lot of the reluctance is either coming from particular parts of the world where there's real mistrust of anything um, that's not physically in your hand but also it's an age thing it's a generational thing and i think so cash will undoubtedly diminish and diminish and diminish and it's probably now going to be uh, much less used in remittances over the next five years than anybody would have forecast, say, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the rate of acceleration is expanding. But I think the other part is, um, if you look at a lot of the receiving countries, some countries, Kenya being a prime example, you know, digital domestic payments and use of your mobile phone for every financial transaction is so natural to those people that sending money internationally into that system is no different to that. But not every country is that advanced in terms of its own domestic infrastructure around the ability to make digital payments. And when cash is still king for domestic payments, it's very difficult to then accelerate international payments to make a real dent. But I think so what we need to do is to continue to encourage domestic adoption and then international will follow much more easily. And I think there's enough case studies now for different parts of the world to really make a difference. I think Africa is so far ahead with much of this that other parts of the world could really learn from a lot of that. Yeah. And Le Leon, you're 100% right. Like what, what we've seen, like not only from, it, what it boils down to is habits and trust. One is like any anything that you have to change a habit is a point of friction. It's not something that um, you want to do or you feel comfortable doing, uh, even if all the logic says that you should be doing this new habit. Like it's, it's just human nature. So if you're using cash most of the time, chances are you're gonna prefer to do cash in this transaction and you have to have a really good catalyst to push you off that um, previous habit and preference. Mm -hmm. The trust aspect is the critical thing. And what we've seen at WorldPay across financial services is trust is the primary catalyst that uh, gets you into the door and through the transaction process. So with, with every additional page that you have on your website for KYC, for onboarding, 30% of people drop out of that process. Um, and that that's obviously terrible for customer acquisition. It means it costs more. It means that they might go to your competitor that might be doing it easier or might not even consider the product for a couple of years as a result. But what we've noticed is that if you put logos or use things that people trust, so for example, the Visa logo at the beginning of the uh, transaction often yields a lot fewer dropouts because they know, oh, 
there's this company I have never worked with, but if Visa is there, I, I feel I can, can trust it uh, as a result. Or if you have the partnerships on that are on there that they trust, or the that ultimately yields the uh, changes the habit in the way that needs to happen. Um, as Leah mentioned, there's going to be some countries that are going to be ahead on this versus others, and it's going to be because of this habit, because the trust systems are there. And there's going to be other countries where they don't have these trust marks to really drive people from one um, habit of paying or transferring money to the other. So basically, the panel uh, of uh, the panel of experts here uh, feels that the statement "cash is king" um, is an overstatement. Um, the rate of adoption into digit, you know, of the rate of adoption of of of, of transitioning that's happening right now from cash to digital is happening is happening at a pace uh we hadn't imagined it's it's so rapid uh, i think uh, the, one of the top big three they uh, i was looking at their uh, the stats um i think they're like close to 30 or 35 percent uh they, you know of their total remittance volume is now digital contrast this to three years ago when i was um, in one of the conferences i heard they said that digital was five percent so over a period of three years one of the big three players their digital remittances have uh, increased from five to thirty percent which is significant um alex you you made a comment obviously you, you're coming from a payments industry uh perspective as well it'd be interesting to see and payments of course we see payments we see remittances uh, and payments you know, as uh, um, as sister sister industries, um, in the payments industry, what do you think is coming next? Because obviously, the pay payments industry has to play a crucial role to support the remittance industry from a digital as they go digital. Um, what's coming next? How are you responding? To so, this? yeah, no, I think there there are three areas that we think of. One is how do we make for a frictionless experience for customers and how do how do we like enable that um how do we enable people to grow quickly into the markets and the corridors that they want to be in and then finally how do you ensure that you can have real-time treasury in the future because that's obviously probably one of the biggest challenges that a lot of remittance companies have today um so first off in terms of frictionless payments we we're we're trying to make sure that all the different options are there um, for for customers to actually pay in the way they prefer um, in a way that's going to be easiest for them. Um, in a lot of markets, we always talk about open banking and open banking is great for people who are sending money from certain countries because it is a great experience, great API. Um, like and it's much easier to transfer money and have that feeling of trust in the money transfer company um, that they're working with, which is great. Um, in other uh, other words, there's also different types of alternative payment methods that are coming about, which are quite quite applicable. And that's going to be um, it depends on what country that you're in, uh, but offering those so that you have the options that are necessary in that space. So that's one area of customer friction. Um, in terms of payouts, we're all about real-time payments. So how do you, if you're wanting to get real-time payments um, digitally, that means that how do you work with Visa, Visa Direct, MasterCard Send to make sure that it gets your accounts in certain ways? How do we work with the right banking partners to make sure that your money comes straight away for consumers because um, I, I, I know my first experience with the digital money remittance company was uh, I sent it in and I could not see where my money was going for multiple days until it up, popped into my account. Um, that transparency uh, and even better, making sure it can cross the border almost immediately is awesome. And what does that what does that mean? It means that we have to get better at real time settlement and real time um, and, and funding opportunities for our, our customers. And you'll probably see that a lot offered a lot more by payments companies in terms of how do we facilitate bridge financing for a money uh, money transfer company to make sure a settlement is real time. Uh, so you don't have to worry about the liquidity that's being floated between that moment that you're accepting money and you're paying out on the other side to enable you to do real time payments. Um, you'll definitely see that coming uh, out a lot more. 
Uh, longer term, we'll, we'll definitely see greater use of cryptocurrencies and CBDCs, but that thankfully that's, uh, that's a future, future us problem for a bit. I would say that's more of a five year, 10 year um, pursuit, that depending on where the various central banks are going. In which case we're going to have to think about what are the other things that we offer as uh, remit, uh, financial services companies, uh, is payments um, to expand our um, breadth of products to add more value to our various customers on the side of paying in, but also on the side of paying out. There's a new buzzword uh, we're hearing, super apps. Um, I was in Saudi Arabia four months ago. Um, uh, I was uh, using one of these taxi services like Uber, Kareem, uh, Bolt. There are quite a few actually uh, that have sprung up. Uh, one of them was, I think it was Kareem. Um, I'm not getting paid by Kareem, by the way, but uh, here. Uh, but I think they were offering something interesting. They were offering on the app the ability for someone to order a, a, a nurse. And they would send a nurse within 24 hours to do a COVID test on you, you know, PCR test on you, et cetera. And, and you know, this is all happening from that one super app, if you will. And that's the buzzword here in our industry. Um, a lot of these new, um, you know, these companies from neighboring verticals, peripheral, uh, peripheral uh, industries, um, they, they, they have an established customer base and they're always thinking of, um, generating you know um revenue from new sources and you know remittance becomes the obvious choice i mean if they can do that uh because it's a case of as uh, elizabeth mentioned earlier apis the word api is a case of plug and play the apis are these days from technology vendors especially are so sophisticated that it's just a case of plug and play so if you have an existing app like an uber app or what have you kareem or they can simply plug into, I don't know, uh, Remit One's API or Azaz API and take advantage of the services, you know, that they have uh, through uh, through the APIs. There's not much work to do. Um, can you just define the, the word super app and then we'll we can we can discuss uh, what we mean by this all encompassing mobile app? Yeah, no. Um, so uh, in super app, it's definitely one of the fluffier terms. It definitely means different things in different countries, but um, it is exactly as you described. It's one one app that um, can connect you to a variety of different services that are out there, whether that be um, home, home services, financial services, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you have a one-stop shop um, that is in the experience that you prefer to um, to essentially get everything done in your your life and a lot of you see this kareem does a great super app you have super apps in asia which are quite popular in singapore hong kong uh in particular um but also it doesn't necessarily mean that um and like it has to be tied to the everyday things that you're doing like ordering food or ordering your cab it's whatever is where where that customer experience is expecting these things. And from a financial services perspective, it's we can embed um, as remittance companies, as payments companies, as um, even from lending in the future um, into any of these type of experiences so that um, a customer can be in that one place and get the things that they need at the given time in the mm -hmm. order that they might need them. Um, whether okay. it be like, I, I have the Dubai government app and I, I paid my my taxes as well as uh, paid my power bill through that app, mainly because it offered me better payment methods than the uh, going through my other provider, which is great. Um, but that's kind of where you'll you'll see that as um, a key thing, and it also happens to be because you trust this the brand that is all encompassing on that super app. We trust so Kareem because they get us to point A to point B, and therefore anyone they're selecting is probably going to be trusted as a result. So that's the big benefit of super apps there. So you mentioned the, this all-encompassing uh, wallet, yeah, which can be accessed through this app. Uh, Elizabeth, what Hello, I think you cut off. Amir. Did he cut off for everybody? Yeah, okay. uh, yes, he seems completely out. Um, but I think um, 
to talk about um yeah i know what it's the about. digital so for Africa, I think. Uh, let's just wait for amara to come back in a second but just you know we've had digital super apps for over eight years on the african continent and pasa launched the first super app which went from just mobile money wallets to offering health services government payments payments even SME banking services. It even had a white label for banks to use it as well. And what we saw was a real success for services that were adjacent to its core business, but services that were too far off, like the medical services ended up being replaced by companies focused on that. I mean, the Dubai Government Act probably works great because paying taxes and paying bills to the government are its core business. I think what we see uh, a lack of is real self-awareness self self with some of the companies that believe they can do everything just because they have a user um, a user base i think when we see uber uber eats delivery in london nobody's using it anymore because they don't incentivize the drivers to, to do the same things that the food delivery specialists can do so i think let's just keep in mind basic business principles just because we have technology doesn't mean we're going to abandon the basics of business operations which is stick to what you know and and that you can do competitively with a with a unique service um and i'm hi emmer we're just been talking a little bit about super apps and and yeah. the way the telcos in africa launched these 10 years ago and were really successful when the services were adjacent to their core business but started to struggle when they strayed too far and I think what super apps do is it's very easy for them to bring new services to the market as a first mover, but then those quick second um, companies kind of come in and steal the idea and do it in a more targeted way. Um, and definitely what we've seen, um, given the fact that we launched the first crypto um, product on the African continent in 2013, and we were the first company in the world to offer an exchange between um, Bitcoin and mobile money. And um, we've been trading crypto and processing remittances for over eight years. Um, we've seen these as two very different businesses and we keep trying to merge them, but the users were not the same. And then about three to four years ago, we suddenly started to see, so I, I disagree with Alex, it's not in the future, it's already three years ago. Some of our larger remittance customers paying us in stable coins um, and paying, first paying us in, in the more stable cryptocurrencies like um, Bitcoin, Ethereum, but then moving into stable coins and we see quite a significant volume. Now, given the fact that the regulatory regimes around the world prefer these things to be licensed separately, we do need to have two entirely segregated business lines all the way from corporate governance to business structures, to treasury accounts, to bank accounts. So we're running essentially two businesses at once. Now, this is really only for the super operators to do any further kind of divergence from that makes our core business weaken not because we're we are weak just because you know we do this in such an expert way but it would be very complex for a super app to come in and to run multiple licensed product lines with different licenses with different operating structures with different treasury functions it's very easy to get developers to launch a new feature function on the map in a few sprints it's another thing to dominate the market in the face of incumbents and what I what I've been as one of the first fintechs on the African continent that's been growing for so long, we've been trying to convince banks to let us run their white label remittances for them. And what they usually say to us is, give us a technology, we can do this ourselves. And we think, oh my gosh, no. You know, it's more than just plugging into the API. It's who's gonna do the user acquisition, who's gonna do the marketing, how are you gonna run your treasury? How are you going to make a market in those things? There's a lot to think about. So what we really love to say to customers and clients and partners who want to launch their own product is, why don't you work with an existing company that knows how to do this? You could put your branding on it, but really think about whether your team can run this business. And I think there's this historic feeling of ownership, of centralization, of we're a bank, we need to own everything. We can't outsource. Um, and then you end up with very clunky products once they come to market. So Kareem is a very agile young team. They're doing really good, but in a few years, they might not be so young and agile anymore. And then how do they keep that agility as they go forward? So for companies that are coming from the traditional brick and mortar space, they're even more at, um, 
at a bit of a challenge for them to launch something so agile. So our recommendation for customers that want a white label is, you know, work with companies that know what they're doing. Like Remit once has a great product. It's a white label product. But maybe think about devoting a team to just doing that. There's a lot of acquisition happening now in the fintech space in emerging markets, specifically around these financial services. People are acquiring and aqua hiring young companies, not just for their licenses, not just for their technology, but for their operating team. So let's not forget that actually a product going all the way to market that's going to dominate is more than just the user experience on the app. I think it's a change in mindset that, 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 that we need. And I think, you know, uh, we can cite a few examples in the industry where this change in mindset uh, is happening. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I'm sure I'm, um, most of you are far more experienced than me. Uh, I've been in this industry for 13, close to coming up to 14 years. Um, I've seen, uh, I mean, a big example is banks. Um, Banks, as Elizabeth mentioned, they've got a lot of do's and don'ts. They're quite rigid in their uh, approach. But the client, the, the banks that we sold our platform, our technology to, uh, they've changed over the years. Before, they wanted everything in-house, on-premise. Now, they, they, are, they, are, they are very much open to the idea of, you know, um, hosting customer data, uh, you know, giving that responsibility to a third party like us. So we're managing their data as a managed service. Um, this is a big change, um, and I think um, th there's more change coming. But I think, yeah, we still have some way to go before banks um, and other uh, and other businesses actually um, 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 understand the meaning of collaboration. There's a lot that can be achieved um, uh, through collaboration. Uh, Elizabeth, how far? So, so can I just ask? Have you patented this idea of using uh, crypto? Is that um, you know to 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 send remittances? from UK to Nigeria, for example. Uh, why is it that MoneyGram, Western Union, RIA, the big players, why haven't they adopted this idea? What well, MoneyGram, of course, yeah, MoneyGram, of course, invests quite heavily with a cryptocurrency company. So I think they, they've been trying, maybe they didn't choose the right horse in that I situation. <laughs> but uh, for many years ago, I think there's two reasons. And it's very similar to just the general FinTech space where a lot of people just put their hands over their ears and said, no, there's no future where my margins don't look like the way they looked in the past, right? I can't accept it. <laughs> this is what my margins were. This is my, my monopoly status mm. was in this market. I just cannot accept a future where a bunch of kids running around who don't comb their hair are gonna be taking my margins from me. And then sure enough, all around the world, we're 15 years into the first version of FinTech wave. Here we are dominating. So, I mean, at this point, you know, we're entering middle age in the first generation of startups and we're still here and we're still growing and we're some of the biggest growing companies in the world. So I think the, the original traditional finance players were very hesitant to do that. And similarly, some of the money remittance companies were just sitting back enjoying monopoly status. How many reports have there been published about mm. the top two companies and the ways they've really dug their feet in maybe some really wild ways they, they gain yeah. monopoly status in some markets and just thought, you know, maybe it's the future, but if I can block it, why not? And I think one of them did a last ditch effort to think about how to do that, but really every other FinTech and every other remittance company has already embraced it. I mean, one of our early um, developers is now number two at one of the largest remittance companies in the world. I won't tell you which one. Um, and he built our whole blockchain platform. So I think it's not a question of whether they're going to do it. It's a question of how they were thinking about it, how they're going to make it operations. We really think of cryptocurrencies and digital currencies as currencies. And it's really a question of what works best. If there's a currency that's liquid, that can settle 24 seven, that is accepted, that you can trace, that your treasury feels comfortable holding, why wouldn't you use it as a method of settlement? I mean, when it's, I always use the example, when it's President's Day, which it was last weekend in the United States, why should I not be able to clear bank settlements in West Africa? You know, we're not celebrating the same holidays. If it's a dollar holiday, why should my entire business be put on hold because the U.S. market is, you know, at the beach that day? It doesn't make any sense. This is a 24-7 world we live in. This is not necessarily a U.S. bank, you know, nine to five U.S. time settlement. And the, the most beautiful thing, which I think it's overlooked with all the hoopla and the excitement about things, um, is the fact that this is a 24-7 settlement currency. It's amazing. But, you know, we had to think through 
compliance. We had to think through corporate governance, structuring. It took, it took a few years for a bunch of treasury teams to get their brains around it. But I think at this point, um, it's here to stay. We have so much institutional investment in this space. And every remittance company, every large fintech is talking to me, is talking to my counterparts about how to trade this, not only for a settlement purpose, which is the first way they used it, but also how to give it give access to their customers if they want it. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think I'll, I'll, yeah, I was gonna say, like, I completely agree with Elizabeth. Like we have a full team of 40, 50 people who are focused almost exclusively on cryptocurrencies at the moment. Um, and it, the key thing is, like, it's not that it's not the, a great solution. I think it's the fact that so many people are just hesitant because of the volatility that you've seen in the past, but that is the past. Um, and a lot of the, these things- And well, then I guess you haven't traded people. the Nigerian Naira. It's quite volatile. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, but that's the thing is like, they're, they're, the, the thing is that the cri uh, cryptocurrencies, like they are currencies, they are, uh, and they're going to be, there's, a lot of clear value in them and that is that great ability, if not being backed by our government counterparts delivering that sooner than later so like my advice for anyone who's operating in this space is if you're not already considering it you should and you should prepare for it uh and make sure you have partners surrounded or you surround yourselves with partners who are able to um help you not only deliver the key things that you need to have happen today but prepare for tomorrow as well perfect um the discussion is uh really uh interesting um i honestly don't want it to stop there's a uh, it's uh, but we we have to try to stick to our times and i still have a few key questions to ask um we'll try and we'll aim to we'll give ourselves another eight minutes and then and then uh, open the floor to Q&A. Um, Leon, his questions for you and then for Hassan. It'll be uh, interesting to get your input on this. What obstacles do uh, or challenges do you see along the horizon? What do MTOs or exchange houses and other players in the money transfer space need to prepare for now? Hello, Leon, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, I was just saying, I don't think eight minutes is going to cover it, and I'm not going to talk for that long anyway. So I'll just pick out a few things. I think some of it sort of builds on the, the last uh, discussion from uh, Elizabeth and, and Alex, which I, I think, you know, uh, there's probably a few things. One is, one of the obstacles is, I think it's come up enough, is if you're not doing a fully digitalized solution now then either you're too late or you need to do something like immediately uh you're probably too late to be honest but if you're not doing anything that's probably the biggest thing you've got other things that have been with us for a while i think the whole regulatory environment is always there uh it's always challenging it's always changing and i think the last discussion is you know, one of the challenges with crypto and so on is at the end of the day, the regulators are from governments and governments are still trying to catch up and understand all the implications and everything on this. So actually, the one of the big challenges is, is trying to work through the, the regulatory minefield. I think we also have big problems still with uh, de-risking. I know We've probably been talking about this at conferences since at least 2012, if not before. And I think it just rears its head in a different form. It's almost like from the cash viewpoint, it's pretty clear what the approaches of most uh, businesses are, uh, sorry, most countries, and therefore the banks and service providers to remittance companies is reasonably well known. And either you adapt to what the banks want or you get out of the market. I think the challenge is that with um, fintechs uh, and, and new entrants, particularly if you have the word crypto anywhere near your name or product description, there's a lot of banks that are you know, keeping you out of the market. You know, countries like Australia, which you would think would be you know, pretty sophisticated in many ways, trying to get banks to actually operate and offer services to anything that's not something that they recognize is nigh on impossible and i think that is an ongoing uh, situation so it really means for companies they've got to have 
you know, a good understanding of the legal basis for their um, operations, the ability to be able to deliver proper solutions really, really, really quickly. Um, and I think, you know, probably the biggest obstacle, and uh, again, Elizabeth mentioned it about margins, the cost, the amount you can make from a remittance transaction is going to be declining, is already declining, and it's going to continue to decline, particularly the, for the traditional operators, which means probably two things. One is they have to be able to change their business model and bring their customers with them, which comes back to the trust question amongst others. But I think, um, you know, the other point is that they've really got to start looking at, well, if our business is moving money from A to B, and that's all we do, is that sustainable? Or do we need to offer, you know, adjacent financial services to these customers that we've invested a lot of money in trying to capture? And can we leverage those additional revenue sources um, as we move into the future? Um, there's a lot more geopolitical, et cetera, et cetera, but I'll probably stop at that point in the interests of uh, time and let somebody okay. else go. Um, a question for uh, Hassan. Uh, it's one thing, of course, uh, to say that we want to go digital, uh, and but actually doing the transition uh, is a challenge in itself. Uh, as a very successful organization uh, in the Middle East, um, you know, wh what are your thoughts on this? The, you know, the, I'm talking, I, I want to focus on the transition part. Uh, sure. You know, what are the typical challenges an MTO, uh, you know, would face as it transitions? And how do we address sure. it? Sure. Uh, you have to start from, from, from the perspective of, of the UI and UX. And I think I echo some of the, um, some of the comments from my colleagues here. Uh, provided you can deliver uh, a seamless uh, seamless customer journey, generally that really is the basis of you sort of transitioning uh, transitioning your customer base. Now, really, what what you do on the back end, you know, in terms of efficiencies, uh, within the uh, within your funding, within your your, your pre funding, your your treasury and, and whatnot, and that's really subject to um, you know to do different. I would say uh, players have different uh, uh, degrees of success of, of how well how well they can execute that. You know, you are seeing an environment of, of thinning margins. You know, you are seeing an environment of increasing compliance costs. So, so really, really only only the highly compliant and highly competitive and highly agile uh, businesses will continue to succeed. Now, we are seeing some of the larger players, like for instance, Western Union. You know, who have done very success, uh, a very good job at uh, you know at, at, at de delivering a very strong and digital product. I mean, we, we are the exclusive partners of West, of, of Wood.com within the OE. So we essentially offer a remittance as a service to them, and we, we, we you know, we, we process a lot of the payments. It's their interface, and then we, we're the back engine. So, you know, on the one hand, on the one hand, you know, we are competing with these fintechs, uh, and I welcome uh, Elizabeth and all these fintechs to come and uh, and uh, and disrupt this market. It's keeping us on our toes, and uh, and and you know, we're more than up for the challenge. So bring it on. <laughs> Uh, and on the, on the other side, we're also competing and and, uh, and collaborating with a lot of these fintechs. So you know you don't have to compete in, in every element in every dynamic of uh, of your market or, or your products. You know that there are there are certain ideas uh, you know that, that they bring to the table that you know by, by partnering with an established player, you know that they can they can certainly benefit from. So so on the one side you're competing, on on the other side you know you're you're collaborating. And uh, Alex, I'm not sure if the uh, if the product you're referring to was was MPay. You know, we we are the first remittance partner to to join hands with them. So uh, you know, in terms of in terms of in terms of uh, let's say digital uh, preparedness and, and dealing with partners, you know, uh, we, we're one of the few players in the market that actually have that that single API where we can invite fintechs uh, to actually uh, plug and play uh, and and work work with a with a with a regulated um, you know strongly regulated uh, financial institution. You know, with the, with strong governance and and and, and a very uh, very robust track record, you know, and compliance you know, within uh, within this market. So uh, I I believe that there are certain large MTOs that that, that will uh, I would say do quite well within the transformation. I think Western Union is, is a great example of that. But then then there are others that um, that don't necessarily have the the strength of the network and the strength of uh, of presence in various regions to be able to to, to weather to weather the storm. Uh, so that's really my, my view in a nutshell. I wish we had more time. We could have uh, we could have gone into a lot more depth. I'm, sh I'm uh, sure we, many of these subjects. <laughs> I'm sure we all have a lot to say on this question. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. I uh, wish we had more time. But the, the, where the questions have started coming coming in, and I'll 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 look at the 
you know, the content of the questions and see what's most, uh, here's a really interesting question. Uh, it says to everybody, who do you see winning? Uh, the question is from Amir, uh, it's not me, it's not somebody else. Who do you see winning the super app versus marketplace battle when it comes to accessing financial services? Now, uh, Amir hasn't defined what he means by marketplace, but um, I think my understanding is, uh, uh, you know, companies like FX Compared or Money Cloud, the equivalent of Confused.com or Money Supermarket, where people go and seek out financial, you know, if you want to send money, for example, they want to, you know, from country A to country B, they want to, they want to go to a marketplace and find out, you know, which company they should use, um, you know, get, which will give them the best FX rate, etc. So that's what I believe he means by, by the word marketplace. So who would win in a battle between super app versus marketplace? Marketplace been around for a long time, uh, for the last 10 years at least. Uh, people have been talking about this. Super app is relatively new. Um, Alex, want to kick things off? I I, I know this is a cop out, but it's it depends. Um, is it's going to depend on one is like what what are the aspects of the market that we're we're talking about? Um, so there are going to be situations where the super app is going to be preferred, either because that is the 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 place where they or the brand that they trust, um, or that that's where they're getting other services that they prefer. To use and because it's all in one place it's easier to just accept that i'm going to have a higher price or that i trust i'm going to have a better price for my remittance through the super app um there are going to be markets where um what happened in insurance in the uk is that you do have like aggregators and uh marketplaces and people realize oh this this company is regulated by the gov the government so i can trust that i'm going to get the service i'm getting or i'm um, and therefore the low price, even though it might be suspiciously low, is actually still going to get me my insurance product. It's the same thing there. As long as you have the trust infrastructure behind one or the other, and that will depend on the countries that are that you're working in, that will lead to whether super apps will be preferred or marketplace will be preferred. And it will depend on what segments and what habits of those segments there are. I'm sure we can build a marketplace super app. So, you know, it just certainly, and it would be interesting to see what other uh, other things you'd uh, pair up with that, because we, we were talking briefly is like, okay, if we, what we have to think about is not just what do we do as uh, like, what, what do you do as a remittance company, but what are the additional services that you need to think about to create that value add for your, your customer to compete, not just on price, but on creating the experience they're looking for um, at the points of sale and points of transfer that they're hoping to get. Yeah, any comments from Elizabeth and Leon Hassan on this question? I think it's just really about the company that does it. I mean, we're seeing in Europe Revolut um, and TransferWise coming at this from very different ways, one from the banking way, one from the money transfer way, both kind of converging with the same set of products um, and being very successful. Again, it's, it's they both have very slick user interfaces. They're very selective about what they do. It's very different than the telco super apps we see more in emerging markets. Um, I think the marketplace where you're going online, um, you know, looking is not um, something that the younger segments are using. So we're not seeing that, you know, inherent into the to the youth population. So I guess I think customer segments are pretty split um, depending on age and just native digital nativeness. Yeah, I think to me, it ultimately comes down to who owns the customer. And if you've got the right product, and uh, I would tend to lead towards a super app has more to offer a marketplace by definition, unless you actually own the customer accessing that marketplace, then you you're going to be challenged because the definition of a marketplace is you're going to push them off to another service provider. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, even if it's sort of white labeled through you. And I think we see Alex, the example was a good one of the UK, where actually, actually a number of companies deliberately choose to not be associated with the marketplace um, to promote their own services, because they believe that the trust and their proposition outweighs 
the way that the marketplace finds products and services. So ultimately, for me, it comes down to who owns the customers. And I tend to favor in the future, that will be more likely to be super apps for the right types of customers who've built up that trust level. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. Um, this is a question for, I believe, uh, applies to Elizabeth. Um, give me one second. What's the question? Sorry, Elizabeth. The question is, what is the implication of using stable coins for settlement? I can see we have we have quite a few fintech attendees here uh, looking at cryptocurrency. So this question will help. Yeah, them. sure. So let's divide it into two things. So we have stable coins, which are basically a derivative of an existing currency, which means it's pegged to another currency, usually the US dollar. There's no volatility outside of what the dollar moves. So you're eliminating the volatility that everybody complains about for other cryptocurrencies. I personally love it, but other people don't. Um, so when you have a stable coin, it's basically a digital version, I will, I'll say. It's a very like watered down explanation, a digital version of, let's say, the US dollar, like USDC and USDT are two of the most popular stable coins. We have seen, for a lot of reasons, very corporate fortune 50 companies and you know as a finance processes currencies and payouts for not just remittance companies but also for businesses for enterprise level and we have seen an adoption of these stable coins by treasury departments that frequently that previously were very afraid of any kind of digital cryptocurrencies there's been a lot of education a lot of lobbying a lot of work um, to help these companies understand how to use this. I think also if you look at the research, 10 years ago, a treasury uh, professional or executive would be very unwilling to use a digital company or a, a third party to process a payment. And now today they're much more willing to do that. So I think there's been a general awareness and education. If there's no volatility, if it's liquid enough to not have to worry about any slippage, it really is a no-brainer to use something that settles 24-7, especially if you're working with third parties around the world that accept it and you one click and you can process payouts everywhere, as opposed to sending wires, following up on lost wires, all that headache of where are they, all the POP proof of payments, tracking down the different banking. It really eliminates a lot of the admin um, without adding any volatility. Now, of course, there's a little bit of education. You have to open up an account at an exchange, but some of these exchanges are massive, 32 billion in assets, you know, licensed, publicly traded. Um, there's a real spectrum in what the exchanges look like here. So I think if you're looking for a very stable exchange to do this, it's, it's quite simple. Okay. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Leon, this is a question for you. Uh, to, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, we seem to have you know quite a few fintech entrepreneurs uh, on the session. Is it too late to start a new remittance company? We have noticed a hefty cost in opening a bank account. We're all aware of that, of course. Um, and uh, we have we have noticed a hefty cost in, op in opening a bank account. And your talk about profit margins shrinking has me concerned about pursuing a startup in the remittance industry. Can I still be profitable? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It's a good question. I'm not sure it's possible to answer it uh, mm -hmm. on this call in a couple of minutes. I use Alex's I, I was phrase. just going to say, you only have one minute. <laughs> yeah, okay. I use Alex's phrase and say it depends. And I almost think that um, if you're looking at it from the cost of opening a bank account, um, that's probably the wrong place to be starting it's you know the standard business thing what is your model have you got a viable um customer base that you can target with something that's attractive and then drive from there down to can you can you what i think the question is what would it take for me to be profitable with the products that i'm designing and so on i'm sure it's not too late depending on which corridors as well and what the actual overall um specifics are around the product so obviously be very happy to talk separately yeah. but i think in the time available um, i wouldn't say it's definitely too late but i think you really have to be clear about your model 
yeah. and how you're gonna and who your customer base is and how you're gonna get there in the first place. Yeah, thank you. I think what, uh, just to add to that, one of the you know the uh, these new up and coming interesting models that people are talking about in our industry is the RAS model, the remittance as a service, and I think that's very interesting and we should explore that. Of course, we'll try and share some more information. We have quite a few. Uh, um, uh, we have we have quite a bit of literature on on RAS, and we can talk about that uh, on a separate session. Uh, we'll take note um, of the gentleman who sent this question and respond to them. Um, okay, so it's time. To, um, it was a really good session. Thank you very much. It was an absolute pleasure to have uh, Alex, Leon, Hassan, and Elizabeth join me here. And thank you to our audience. Uh, it's time, it's uh, uh, it was uh, a really interesting discussion. Uh, of course, we had a few differences of opinion, and it was always it's always good, it's always fun, it's always productive. I hope it benefited the audience, they enjoyed the session. Thank you very much to everybody for attending this session, and a big, big, big thanks to our panelists. We hope you found the session useful. Our next panel will be starting straight after this session at 11.30 uh, GMT. So that is in 15, 17 minutes from now. Um, after that, we have at 13.30 GMT, we will be discussing compliance and AML for money transfers. Make sure you don't miss it. We'd also like to send a special thanks to our event sponsors, Vine, Nyragram, Trust Payments, Asa Finance, WorldPay, GBG, and Currency Cloud. Please do make sure that you visit their virtual booths between the panel sessions, which you can navigate to via the menu at the top of your screen. If you want to review what has been discussed today, we'll be providing a written summary and video upload of all of today's sessions at remit1.com and in our next Remit1 newsletter. So keep an eye out for that. Lastly, thanks again, everybody. And please get in touch if there's anything you'd like to discuss regarding the session or how Remit1 or any of our partners can help your money transfer business. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you.